Thank you, Pastor, and thank you for being back tonight. It's a joy to be here, and I appreciate the fact that Pastor asked me to come uh, early before the conference and spend this time with you, and it's been a privilege to meet many of you today, and uh, thank the Lord for what he's doing here at Bible Baptist Church, and uh, Pastor gave me a little bit of the history and uh, uh, all that God has done in the past, and I believe some great things still ahead, don't you, that God wants to do right here at Bible Baptist Church, and thankful for you, and uh, do pray for this week. Uh, that God will work in the hearts of these preachers. You know, if preachers get revived, then uh, they can go back with revival in their hearts to their people. And I'm sure that's part of the, the goal of the conference, to uh, just have some good fellowship with God's people, let that iron sharpen some iron, and uh, get some word of God in them, and, and uh, go back to their congregations excited about what God would have us to do. Well, let's go to the book of Isaiah once again tonight in chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 tonight. And we'll look at a few verses that I think will be familiar to you, but I want to look at them from perhaps a little bit different angle in a way that hopefully can encourage us tonight. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse number 1. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. There will be seasons in your life where you'll wonder, where is God? You ever been there? You ever said to yourself, God, where are you? I need you right now. I need you to answer this prayer. I need you to meet this need. And God seems distant. God seems vacant. God seems to have left the premises. Our prayers don't seem to go anywhere. He doesn't seem to be listening. There will be seasons in our life where we'll wonder, where is God? When I was a junior in college, I had made friends with a young lady in my freshman year. She was a sophomore when we met, and we began to... Uh, date, I guess, as you call it, back in college, and, and uh, we, we weren't serious. We weren't talking about getting married or anything like that. We were both focused on finishing college and, and getting that behind us, and so we hadn't entered into those kinds of conversations, but our friendship certainly was developing and maybe headed that direction, and, and yet she was a year and a half ahead of me in school and, and uh, was going to be graduating uh, in uh, December, at the end of the first semester of that year, my junior year, and she had already signed a contract to go teach in a Christian school in northern Indiana. She was uh, uh, called to teach, she felt, and, and uh, was now prepared, and this school wanted her to come and, and teach, and so she was excited about that. Well, I still had a year and a half of school, and, and God was uh, working in my life toward preaching and toward evangelism. And these two directions didn't just seem to fit. And we talked about it many times. As I said, we were good friends. We enjoyed being around each other. We felt like there was a lot in common, but we were going different directions. And we thought, this can't possibly be God's will for us. And we were having that conversation one afternoon, and we decided that uh, it was time to call our relationship quits. That uh, we were going to end this relationship because it obviously was not God's will. After that conversation, I went to an afternoon speech class, and 
I always enjoyed that class. It was an upper level speech class and I knew everybody in there. We had taken a lot of classes together. We always had a lot of fun in that class. But that day, I chose a seat over by the windows all by myself because I couldn't stop crying. Now, I'm not a crier, but that day I couldn't stop crying because all of a sudden there was this, this emptiness in my heart. There was this hole in my heart, and I, I, I just couldn't get a hold of my emotions. I'm sure the teacher thought, what is wrong with you? Get a hold of yourself. And I remember sitting there thinking, God, where are you? It was 1976. I was invited to preach in three churches in Los Angeles, California. Now, I had never been to the state of California, much less the city of Los Angeles. But I got in my Volkswagen Beetle, and I began to make the trek across the United States, 55 mile an hour speed limits, no interstates, two lane highways, no air conditioning. <laughs> And I remember going along there in that little Volkswagen across the country, and day after day went by, and I thought, you know, they lied to me in geography class. There is no Pacific Ocean. <laughs> I mean, I just kept driving and driving and driving. Thinking, there is no place called California. But finally, I crossed into the state of California and found Los Angeles. We didn't have GPS in those days. We had what they called maps. For those of you that are young, that's a sheet of paper with lines on it that represent roads. And uh, I had a map, you know, and I'm trying to find the city of La Puente, right in the heart of Los Angeles. And, and I'm, I'm making my way into that city and finally found the church. It was about 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, and I was just excited to be there for this first week of three, uh, in three churches there in L.A. And I drove in the parking lot, and there was a man working on some flower beds alongside the building. And so I got out of my car and made my way over to him and introduced myself, and he introduced himself as the pastor. And after we introduced ourselves, he said, uh, what can I do for you? I said, well, I'm here to hold a revival. He said, I don't know anything about that. Here I was in the city of Los Angeles, and I thought, okay, thanks. I got back in my car, and I, I, I thought, what am I going to do? I, I didn't have a cell phone. Nobody had cell phones. I didn't have a credit card. Nobody had credit cards. I didn't have a debit card. Nobody had debit cards. I had $36 in my pocket. And I remember driving down that street that was in front of the church there, and I drove for about 10 or 12 blocks. And I came to a hotel that I affectionately call a flea bag hotel, there were actually two of them side by side, and I chose the better of the two, I thought. I walked inside, and I said to the lady, I said, uh, could I see the manager? She uh, said, okay. So she called, and a guy came out. He said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I, I'm going to be in your town here for the next six days, and I need a room. He said, no problem. I said, well, there's a little bit of a problem. I only have $36. He uh, thought for a minute, and he reached under the counter, and he pulled out a ring of keys, and uh, he said, follow me. We went out a back door into this courtyard area. Now, it wasn't what you're thinking when I say the word courtyard. It was just kind of a space between buildings, and it was piled high with old beds and dressers of drawers and, and old sinks and uh, long grass, and we began to make our way through this pile of junk, and he took one of those keys and opened an iron door and pushed it back, and here was a little room. It was a tile floor. It had a, a military cot in one corner with a mattress on it. There was a shower. There was a sink. There was a toilet, and there was a, a, a metal folding chair. He said, it's all yours, six bucks a night. I took out my $36 and I handed it to him and he walked out the door. When the door closed, I noticed out of my left peripheral something above the door and I turned and there was a, there was a small little television set up on top of the door. It was a shelf above the door and I thought, well, at least I have a TV. And I remember walking over there and clicking that TV on and, and as it came on, it was showing snow these white lines across a black background. And I thought, well, I don't want to watch snow. I'm from the Midwest. I've seen all the snow I want to see. I'm in Los Angeles. And so I, I turned the channel to the next station. It was showing the same program. And all the way around that dial, 13 channels, it was all static. 
And I remember sitting on the edge of that bed thinking, God, where are you? It was 1982. I was traveling with my family now. I had a wife and two children. And we were pulling a a 16,000-pound fifth-wheel trailer around the country, living in it and going from church to church. And we were scheduled to be in a western suburb of Chicago, a city named Warrenville. The pastor there was a wonderful man. He was a church planter. And I had been with him in some other meetings where he had started a church. He'd usually stay two or three years and then find a pastor to take it over, and he'd go on to another town. And here he was in Warrenville, and we pulled in. He was living in a three-story house there uh, uh, in Warrenville, and we backed our trailer into his driveway and got set up. That week, it was one of those weeks where Murphy's Law was in full force. If it could go wrong, it went wrong. We were meeting in an elementary school. The janitor never showed up. We had to break in the building every night just to have the meeting. It was like that all week, just just a terrible crowd. No one would come. It was hard to get people there, and everything seemed to be going wrong. The pastor was very discouraged, and he was not a, a, a man that easily got discouraged. And about Wednesday, I said to my wife, I said, you know, this, this, this church isn't going well. This, this church plant is not like the others that he's been at. This is, this is a rough road here. And I said, this meeting's not going well. We're not being much of a help. And he's discouraged. His wife's discouraged. They had seven children. I said, I think they're discouraged. And I said, I've been thinking. Uh, I don't know what the love offering will be this week. Probably won't be much. But I just think maybe we ought to give it to the pastor. I think he needs it worse than we do. My wife said, yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. I always hated when she agreed with me about stuff like that. I said, well, let's pray about it, you know. (laughs) And so we prayed about it Thursday and Friday, and Friday afternoon we decided that's what we would do. Well, the service ended. It was no better than any of the others we had had, and we made our way back to the house, and he asked us to come in and have some popcorn with the kids and and, uh, fellowship a little bit, and We went in and played some games and had some fellowship, and pretty soon he reached in his pocket and pulled out the envelope, you know, and said, Brother Gatch, here's your love offering. I wish it could be more. And and I, I, for the first time and the last time in my life, I opened that envelope in the presence of the pastor, and I pulled out that check. And as I did, I saw for how much it was, and I was shocked. It was for $250. Now, in 1982, that was a lot of money. And that was an amazing amount of money for a week of revival meetings. But I had already decided what I was going to do, and I turned it over in my palm, and I took out my pen, and I signed the back of that check. And I said, Pastor, we want to give this to your family. Well, he tried to protest, and I put it in his pocket. I said, no, we want you to have it. Well, he began to cry. His wife began to cry. All seven kids started crying. I got out of there. I mean, you know any part of that. (laughs) And you know, when you obey the Lord, you feel really good about it. I mean, you feel like, hey, I did what the Lord wanted, and, and, and that's great. And I slept like a rock that night. We got up the next morning, hooked up our trailer. We were headed to St. James, Minnesota. And I had, uh, I had fuel in both of my tanks. I was ready to go, and we hooked up that trailer and started up the highway into Wisconsin, 94 and over to 90. And we got to La Crosse, Wisconsin. And I looked down, and both of my fuel tanks were on empty. And I still had over 100 miles to go. And I said, God, I need gas. And he said, well, get some. I said, well, that's easy for you to say, but I don't have any money. I gave all my money to the pastor in Chicago. I still didn't have a credit card, didn't have a debit card. I I had no money. And God said, get gas. I said, God, you can't get gas without money. He said, get gas. You have money. I said, Lord, I don't have any money. And in that moment, he reminded me in the trailer, we had bought this this pail for our kids to play in the dirt with and the sand with. It was a yellow pail, and and, uh, the handle had broken the first day they got it. And and so, but they wanted to keep it. It was kind of fluorescent yellow, and they liked the color of it. And so we cleaned it all up, and they, they started putting our pennies in that bucket. We weren't saving them for anything, but every time we got pennies, our kids would throw them in that bucket. And it was about three quarters full. And God said, use that. 
I pulled off the interstate in, La, in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and bought 40 gallons of fuel with pennies. I can still remember the attendant counting them two by two on that glass counter. And I'll never forget his expression, nor will I forget the expression of the seven people standing behind me waiting to pay for their gas. But the Lord miraculously got us to St. James, Minnesota. And we got there, a little Manor Baptist Church, 35 people in that crowd, all of them over 65 years of age, and a wonderful little church on the edge of town. We got our trailer set up. The pastor was working full time at the lumber yard, 50 hours a week, trying to put bread on the table, and, and uh, we, we started that meeting. Well, Sunday morning, went in and had Sunday school and morning service, and afterwards nobody said anything about lunch, so we, we went out and we pulled a few canned goods out of the cupboard and uh, put a few things together, and I thought, they'll feed us tonight, but after the service that night, the pastor said, well, i got to get up at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning, go to work, so I'll see you tomorrow night at 7. We went to bed hungry. The next morning, I was out washing my truck and trailer down. I always tried to get that road grime off of my vehicles on Monday morning. And I was out behind that trailer having a pity party. I said, now, Lord, I know I did exactly what you told me to do in Chicago. I have no doubt about that. And God, you miraculously got us here to St. James. But I said, Lord, where are you now? <laughs> I mean, I can fast this week. That won't hurt me. But I have a wife and two kids in that trailer, and the Bible says if I don't take care of them, I've denied the faith and am worse than an infidel. Where are you? There'll be seasons in your life where you'll wonder, where's God? By the way, your Savior's been there. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cried unto thee in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and they were delivered. They cried, and thou didst deliver them. For I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. All they that pass by shoot out the lip. They mock, saying, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him if he'll have him. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melteth in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, for thou hast brought me to the dust of death. Many dogs have enclosed me. The assembly of the wicked have encircled me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They stare and look upon me. They parted my garments among them. Upon my vesture did they cast lots. Your Savior's been there. And I think Isaiah's there. The king has died. Leadership's gone. And the prophet Isaiah is wondering, God, what do we do? We're vulnerable. We have no king. Lord, where are you? Now, we know from Scripture that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. Aren't you glad for that promise? But like Mr. Robinson, the songwriter, we are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And in those moments, there are three locations where you can always find God. And I believe in this passage, though it has wonderful interpretation, there are three underlying locations here that Isaiah exposes to us. When we sense in that season of loneliness, when we sense in that season, God, where are you? We can always return to that location and we will find God. First, God is always in the holy place. As Isaiah gets a vision of heaven, he sees the throne of God here in these opening verses of chapter 6. 
the seraphims on each side of the throne, and each one has six wings. With twain he covered his face, and twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one of these seraphims cries, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the, and the doors of the post shook at the voice of him that cried. God is always in the holy place. You see, holy is the word that describes everything that God is. God is holy. We have a holy Bible. God is holy. And I want to remind us tonight that holy and unholy cannot coexist. Holy and unholy, righteousness and unrighteousness cannot exist together. What know ye not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are God's. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, I know what people say today. Well, yeah, but this is uh, 2023. I mean, times have changed. God doesn't expect us to live like they did back in the Bible. Well, it's interesting in Titus chapter 2. God tells us in verse 11 that we are saved by His grace. I'm glad that God in His grace is able to save us. We didn't attain salvation. We didn't earn salvation. It's by the grace of God that we're saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. And so He teaches us about that grace in chapter 2 and verse 11 that saves us. And then in verse 12, He says, teaching us, what does this grace teach us? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Now, you know, it doesn't matter if you're reading that in the first century or the 20th century, it's still this present world. And God expects us to live a holy life. Paul told the Corinthians, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. How hard do we work at perfecting holiness? We work at our job. We work at practicing a musical instrument. We work at, at, at writing a sermon. We, we work at building a business. We, we work in a, on, on a sports field or a, a court to, to, to perfect our skills. When's the last time you worked at perfecting holiness? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, follow peace and holiness without which... No man can see the Lord. We've got to return to the holy place. But notice, secondly, the humble place. What's Isaiah's response to this scene that he sees here in chapter 6? As he sees the glory of God, as he hears these seraphims crying, holy, 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 what's his response? Verse 5, woe is me. For I'm undone. God is always in the humble place. One of my fast becoming favorite verses is Isaiah 66 and verse 2, where it says in part, To this man will I look, even to him that is of a poor and a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my word. I don't know about you, but I need God to look my way. I need God to favor me. I need God to bless me. I can't be the Christian I'm supposed to be without God's help. I can't be the husband I'm supposed to be without God. I can't be the parent, the grandparent. I can't be the staff member. I can't be the preacher. I can't do anything without him. Without him, we're nothing. 
And so we need God to look our way. We need God to favor us. But God doesn't hang around his abominations. These six things doth the Lord hate, ye seven are an abomination in him. A proud look. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination unto the Lord. It's interesting, in Psalm 138, verse 6, the Bible says, though the Lord be high. Well, yeah, we, we figured that out this morning, didn't we? We talked about who is God, and, and, and the first point was he's above all. So the Lord, though the Lord be high, Yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. You know, if I were to ask you tonight, who do you respect? Well, it would depend upon the context of conversation, would it not? If you were talking to a musician, maybe a piano player, you were, you were to say to them, uh, who, do you, who do you respect? Who do you, who do you look up to? Well, they, they, would, they would choose someone that's, that's better at the piano than they are. They, they, they would respect someone that has taken more lessons or spent more time perfecting their skill, and they would look up to them as something they want to attain to. If you're talking about sports, if you're talking to a high school athlete, he's probably watching a college athlete. If you're talking about a college athlete, he's probably watching some professional athlete. And they're trying to perfect their skills to match someone that's better than they are. If you're talking to a business person, well, they're looking at some business similar to theirs and the model that they've created. And and then their employees are happy and they're making a profit and they're providing a service that people want. And and, and the business is, is looking up to that model. See, we're always looking up. Well, who does God look up to? He's on the top. He has respect unto the lowly. You see, God resisteth the proud but gives grace to the humble. And high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Uh, God respects the lowly. When I was a, a boy going to church, I heard preachers mention a man by the name of Paul Levine. I, I, I didn't know what he looked like. I had never heard him preach. We'd never had him at our church. I never heard him on tape or anything like that. But I heard preachers talk about Paul Levine, evangelist Paul Levine. And I remember as a boy thinking, boy, I hope sometime in my life I get to meet this fellow. He sounds like a fascinating evangelist. Paul Levine was saved at the age of four. And he was called to preach at the age of four. Don't ever underestimate what happens in junior junior church back there. Uh, His mother said when Paul was called to preach at age four, he would come home on Sunday night and uh, take his little New Testament, jump up on the piano stool and start preaching. (laughs) Paul Levine finished high school at age 15. And he went straight into evangelism. Never went to college. He started preaching revivals. Couldn't drive a car. Had to hitchhike, take public transportation. But he started holding revivals all over Iowa and Minnesota all over the Midwest. By age 17, a blind man named named, uh, Finley traveled with him. And uh, they played their mandolins and they sang. And and these two men went all across the Midwest, Michigan and Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin and, and Iowa and Minnesota. If you go to any of those states tonight and you mention Paul Levine, you'll meet somebody that was saved in one of his revivals. Paul Levine had... A, a, a radio program out of Waterloo, Iowa called Bible Echoes. And six days a week, he preached the gospel on the radio. He had an organization called Bible Tracks Incorporated, still in existence today. I pulled into a Flying J truck stop not long ago as my second home. And I, I pulled in there and I went to use the restroom. I opened the stall door and two tracks fell on the floor. One in English, one in Spanish, both printed by Bible Tracks Incorporated. Printed millions of tracks in hundreds of languages. Paul Levine. I'd heard about him, but I thought, man, I hope someday I get to meet him. Well, in the spring of 1981, I was preaching a revival at the Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. And one morning, a knock came on our trailer door. It was the church secretary. She said, you have a phone call. We still didn't have cell phones. 
And uh, so he had to take the call in the church. And so I ran into the church, and uh, I picked up the phone. And the voice on the other end said, uh, Good morning, uh, Brother Getch. This is Bill Rice III at the Bill Rice Ranch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He said, We've never met. But he said, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the ranch. Well, of course I had. I had heard Bill Rice III's dad preach. I'd heard his uncle, John R. Rice, preach. I'd heard his other uncle, Joe B. Rice, preach. I'd heard his brother, Pete Rice, preach. I, I knew about the, the Bill Rice Ranch. And, 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 and I, I knew all about this ministry, but I'd never met Bill Rice III. He said, Brother Getch, we were wondering if you would be able to come and preach a youth week during the summer of 1983 here at the ranch, two years from now. Do you have your calendar? Well, of course I had my calendar. I always had my calendar. And I looked, and I had the date open that he wanted, and we booked that meeting over the phone. Man, was I excited. I ran back to that trailer. I was excited not to preach to teenagers. I was excited because I was going to meet Paul Levine. You see, the Bill Rice Ranch started in 1953. Bill and Kathy Rice, their oldest daughter, was born deaf. And so they went to Murfreesboro, and they bought 1,500 acres of ground. And they established the Bill Rice Ranch, a place where people could hear the gospel in sign language. And they established the Bill Rice Ranch. Well, there weren't enough people to fill every week with deaf people. And so they started having teen weeks and couples retreats and family camps and so on. And the first youth week was held in 1953. And the speaker was Paul Levine. From that point on, from 1953 into the middle 1990s, every youth week at the Bill Rice Ranch, Paul Levine preached. As the weeks got larger, more in attendance, they added a second speaker to take some of the load off of Dr. Levine. And Bill Rice III was asking me to be that second speaker. I was on cloud nine. I was going to meet Paul Levine. Well, that meeting finally came, and I remember that first night I walked in a side door to the John R. Rice Auditorium. I walked in just about five minutes before the service. There were 1,400 teenagers sitting in that auditorium, 1400, 1,400. I didn't even look at them. I wondered, am I going to meet Paul Levine tonight? And I remember taking a few steps into that auditorium, and a man came over to me, put out his hand. He said, welcome to the ranch, Dr. Getch. It was Bill Rice III. We still had never met. He said, welcome to the ranch. We're so glad you're here. He said, uh, come up on the platform. I want you to meet Brother Paul. Well, I looked up on the platform, and the platform was about eight steps up. It was really high. And there was nothing on the platform except a piano and a pulpit and a pew that went all the way across the back of the, uh, of the, of the platform. It was probably 30 feet long. And there was no person on the platform except for one man sitting at the end of that bench. And his name was Paul Levine. I had seen a picture of him. I thought, that's him. And I'm, I'm, I'm going up right now to meet him. We walked up those stairs, and, and, and Bill Rice the third, he said, Dr. Paul, this is Brother Getch. Dr. Paul had his Bible open. He had a steno notebook hanging out. He had his pen. He's writing his sermon. He's going to preach in 15 minutes. He's, he's writing his sermon. And he closed everything up, and he stood up, and he said, Brother Gatch, he shook my hand with both of his. He said, I am so honored to meet you. I can't wait to hear you preach. I said, I, I can't wait to hear you preach. You know, he said, here, sit by me, sit by me. Whoa. I sat down. He went back to writing his sermon. I tried to read it. I couldn't read a thing he was writing on that paper. <laughs> well, the service started. The doctor, Dr. Stoltenborough began to lead the singing, and that crowd began to sing. And, and I'm sitting there, and Dr. Paul, the whole time, he's writing in, the, in his notebook. And finally, it came time to introduce Dr. Uh, Levine. And so Bill Rice III went up to the pulpit, and he said, All right, young people, now tonight, this first service, we get to hear Dr. Paul Levine. Dr. Levine has been preaching here since 1953, every youth week we've ever had. Does this man that you're going to hear tonight has preached from this pulpit? He said, Dr. Paul, how many sermons have you preached here at the ranch? Dr. Paul wasn't even paying attention. But we heard his name, and his head kind of popped up, and he said, uh, 1,205. And, and Bill Rice said, think of that, young people, 1,205 uh, times this man has preached like he's going to preach tonight. And Dr. Paul, he, he hit me in the ribs. He said, I really don't know how many times I preached. <laughs> he said, all I know is I ran out of sermons a long time ago. <laughs> that was Dr. Paul. 
one of the most humble men I've ever met. I remember a few years later, we were preaching together again at the ranch, and the week wasn't going real good. There wasn't that break yet. There wasn't that breaking open of the, of the week. And it was Thursday night. It was Dr. Paul's time to preach. And all through that song service, he's sitting there with that Bible and that steno notebook and writing and praying. And during the final special number, I just kind of lightly touched his knee and I said, Dr. Paul, I'm praying for you. He leaned into me. He said, oh, thanks, Brother Getch. I need it. I need it. He said, you know, people say, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. I do. But I don't trust the devil. And it was things like that that began to form and shape me. I don't remember the year now. I was asked to preach a conference, much like we'll have this week here at this church in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. I was only to take part in one workshop, just preach one afternoon workshop, a three-hour workshop. Can you imagine? At, right after lunch. And everybody had to come to my workshop. It was the only one offered. And I did my best to hold those preachers' attention for three hours and when I dismiss, boy, everybody's ready to get out of there, go to dinner, and get back for the service that night. And they all began to exit as I finished, and I was closing up shop here at the pulpit. And I gathered my things together, and I was walking off the platform, and as everybody was going out the back of that room, there was one man coming toward the platform. He was grasping from pew to pew, you see, he was legally blind now. His wife, already in heaven, he would join her in two more weeks. Cancer riddling his entire body. But that Bible still open and that spiral notebook hanging out. And when I saw him, I jumped off that platform and I ran to him and I said, Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul, I didn't know you were here. You know what he said? He didn't say, hey, Brother Gatch. You know what he said? He pointed that notebook. And he said, I miss letter E under point five. What was letter E under point five? <laughs> I'm thinking, you don't need it. I mean, you're going to be in heaven in two weeks. Just go sit down and wait. <laughs> Tears began running down his face. He said, oh, Brother Gatch, I need it. I want to know how to love God more. I want to know the Bible better. Tell me what was letter E under point five. That was Dr. Paul. The secret to success of any great Christian is humility. And when God seems absent, we got to get back to the holy place. We got to get back to the humble place. But then look at verse 8. God's always in the harvest place. I heard the voice of the Lord say, Who shall go for us? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. When God seems absent, grab some of those tracks back there. Go knock on some doors. He'll meet you there. When God seems vacant... You can't seem to get through to him? Call the pastor. Say, Pastor, who's in the hospital? Who, who can I go minister to? Who's a shut-in I could go be a blessing to? God's always in the harvest place. You see, he's all about the harvest. That's why he came. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's all about the harvest. He said to the disciples, Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. They're white already to harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth labors into his harvest. We read about the birth of Christ in the early part of the Gospels, and it's a fascinating story that we preach a lot about at Christmas. But then the Bible kind of goes silent about Jesus until he begins his public ministry at age about 30. Except for one time. You remember it? Jesus was 12 years old. Remember this? And his mom and dad, his earthly mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, they, they take him up to Jerusalem to a feast. 
And they go up there and they travel in a company of people, probably for fellowship, maybe accountability, maybe for safety. I don't know, but they traveled in a large company of people. And they go up to this, this festivity and they enjoy the feast there with multitudes of people. And now it's over and so they're returning home. And they get a day's journey. And all of a sudden, they lost God. <laughs> How do you lose God? Now, can you imagine this conversation? Mary says, uh, Joseph, uh, where's Jesus? I, I don't know, Mary. Uh, I haven't seen him. What do, you, what do you mean you haven't seen him? Uh, when, when's the last time you saw him? Well, uh, back in Jerusalem. Joseph, are you kidding me? That was 24 hours ago. Where is Joseph? I, where, is, uh, where is Jesus? I thought he was with you. Well, I thought he was with you. Can you imagine this? And they start saying, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? And they panic. And they think, we left him at church. <laughs> you know? So they hurry back to Jerusalem. And where did they find him? In the temple. And what was he doing? He's answering, as a 12-year-old boy, the questions of the scholars about the scriptures. Now, all the Bible gives you are words. You have to provide the emotion when you read the Bible. These are the words that Mary says to her son, Jesus. Son, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Where hast thou been? Those are the words. That wasn't the emotion. <laughs> have you ever lost your kid at Walmart? I mean, son, where have you been? Oh, I thought something terrible happened. Son, where have you been? And you remember what Jesus said? He said, how is it that you sought me? Wist you not that I must be about my father's business? You should have known where to look. I'd be in the harvest place. God's always in the harvest place. Does God seem absent tonight? Truth is, he's never moved. But sometimes we wander. We go astray as sheep. And we've got to come back to that holy place, that humble place, that harvest place. By the way, that girl I broke up with that afternoon, we'll be married now 49 years next month. But see, at that moment in time, I wasn't ready for marriage. God had some purging to do in my life before I would ever enter into something as holy and sacred as marriage. And those six days I spent in that hotel in La Puente, California, that door never opened. I never talked to a soul. I never ate a bite of food. And I've been in a lot of revival since that time. But I've never been in a better one than those six days. Because it was just me and God in the humble place. See, when I came out of college, I was saying, God, where's the stadium? Bring the crowds. I've got three messages. Let me have them. And God said, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we got to go to the humble place first. And that Monday morning in St. James behind my trailer, as I was having that pity party, a car pulled into the parking lot of the church. It was a 1954 Ford, old antique car. Behind the wheel was a large man who was affectionately known in those parts as Tiny. He weighed well over 400 pounds. Tiny did not attend Manor Baptist Church in St. James, but he had been there the night before, he and his wife and his two little girls. You see, they lived 40 miles away in a town that didn't have a church. And he had come that night and asked the preacher if he could talk to my wife and I. We sat down in that front row after church, and they began to weep. They said, preacher, we don't have a church. This is the closest church. And we just don't know if it's wise to take our girls 80 miles for a service. And we don't know anything about starting a church. Our town needs a church, but we don't know anything about starting a church. What do we do? Well, I didn't know much. But my wife and I sat there, and we cried with them, and we prayed with them, and we gave them the little wisdom we had. He pulled into that parking lot. He saw me behind the trailer, and he rolled the window down. He said, Brother Gatch, do you need any food? I'm thinking.
thinking, who drives into a church parking lot and asks a dumb question like that? I strolled over to the window of his car. I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, do you need any food? I said, well, sure. He said, get in the car. Get in the car. I got in. We started driving. We drove that 40 miles to his house. And I said, Tiny, what, what's, what's this all about? He said, I work for the Jolly Green Giant. I'm looking at this guy, well over 400 pounds. I'm thinking, what, what, what do you do? You're the mascot or what? I mean, <laughs> what? what? I didn't know it, but St. James, Minnesota is in one of the most fertile valleys of agriculture in the entire world. And, and they have thousands of acres of vegetable farms. Del Monte, Jolly Green Giant have these huge processing plants. And, 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 and Tiny was an executive with Jolly Green Giant. He said, Brother Getch, I came out into my garage this morning. I got four freezers in my garage full of food. He said, we mispackage stuff, mislabel stuff. I bring it home, throw it in the freezer. He said, I walked out to go to work, and I thought, I wonder if that preacher's hungry. Now, I'm sitting there hearing this, and I'm thinking, God, this is amazing. This is amazing. But seriously, green beans? <laughs> I mean... I'm hungry, but broccoli? I mean, Lord, couldn't you speak to a beef farmer or somebody? We got to his house. He flipped up that garage, and there were those four freezers, and he opened them up, and I didn't know it at the time, but Jolly Green Giant made lasagna. They made Swiss steak. He started throwing those boxes of food into the back of that car. We got back to the church. We had to borrow the pastor's freezer, the church freezer. Our freezer was full. By Friday night, we were giving boxes of food to anybody that would come and listen to me for just five minutes. You know what God said? Son, you just stay on that front row helping people. I can feed you. Is God missing tonight? We learned this morning who is God. Tonight we've discovered where is God. He's always in the holy place. Do we need to get back to the holy place tonight? Do we need some humility in our life tonight? This country needs a big dose of humility. And I'm afraid in our churches we need some as well. And we got to get back to the harvest place. That's where God is. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you don't move. You stay the same yesterday, today, and forever. But, Lord, we move. We get fickle. We get anxious. We try to run ahead of you or lag behind. And, Lord, we find ourselves wondering where you are. Now, Lord, tonight, if you've put your finger on something in our life that's unholy, help us just to get that right. And Lord, we all need some humility. Help us to be humble before you. And Lord, help us to get our eyes on the harvest. It's easy to look at this world and, and just kind of think, well, they've chosen a way that's not God's way, and who cares? But Lord, we know the answer to this world's problems is, is a Savior. And I pray that you'd help us to stay in the harvest place. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let's just stand quietly if we can. And I'll ask our penis to begin to play at the piano. And as the music begins, if God spoke to your heart, why don't you take time at the altar tonight? Maybe come back to that holy place. Perhaps that humble place. Perhaps roll up your sleeves to the harvest place. Sometimes walking an aisle, it it doesn't make or break a decision, but sometimes when you're talking about locations, it helps to go to a place of prayer that's different. Say, Lord, I'm making a decision about where you are because I need to get there. The holy place, the humble place, the harvest place.